President Biden addressed the nation from the Oval Office Wednesday night. It was the president's first public remarks since his decision to drop out of the presidential race on Sunday. President Biden said the best way forward was to pass the torch to a new generation. You know, there is a time and a place for long years of experience in public life. But there's also a time and a place for new voices, fresh voices, yes, younger voices. And that time and place is now. Our Errol Barnett has more on tonight's presidential address from Studio 57 in New York City. All right, John, thank you very much. We want to begin by breaking down the president's speech, some of the key takeaways and how this could affect his legacy moving forward. CBS News correspondent Skylar Henry joins me from Capitol Hill with um, more on that. I'm wondering, Skylar, the president did stumble slightly through this speech. We know his yeah. family was in the room. It's an incredibly enormous moment. What stood out to you as he made his remarks? Yeah, Errol, four points. And I think contextually, considering what this means for President Biden, really wrapping up 50 years of public service, uh, it, it was one that talked about just really where he wants the country to go, where, what he believes in terms of uh, democracy in and of itself and what he really wants to see in terms of the remainder of his term. Four points really stood out to me. Um, and it talked about the main one, I think, is that does character in public life still matter? Obviously, taking a, a veiled swipe at former President Donald Trump and some of his rhetoric and remarks that he certainly has made along the campaign trail. Uh, aside from that, and what you heard from President Biden there, talking about passing that torch to the new generation, the next generation, really uh, leaning into that endorsement of Vice President Kamala Harris becoming the likely Democratic nominee. Uh, and also the president saying that he reveres the office, but he loves his country, and also saying that democracy is at stake and nothing can come in the way of that, including personal ambition. You know how rare this is for an incumbent president to not seek reelection. Uh, and so for him to make these remarks, to make this decision following all the scrutiny that he's faced over the course of the last, let's call it a month or so, I think was a tremendous one. And so I think in this 11 to 12 minute uh, speech, he certainly sort of laid it out there for the American people really and saying this, saying the choice is now yours. It's up to you, the American voter, to continue this moving forward. And you are going to be uh, the reason the country sort of goes in the way that it does. And I think that certainly was a compelling sort of reminder, saying that this is ultimately you guys' decision in terms of where the country goes from here. And the president obviously leaning into that tonight. And as this brings to an end, his five decade plus career of public service, it's also interesting to acknowledge the weight on his family and those close to him as he reached this very difficult decision. First Lady uh, Dr. Jill Biden released a statement online, um, a handwritten statement that's been translated into text saying, to those who never wavered, to those who refused to doubt, to those who always believed, my heart is full of gratitude. Thank you for the trust you put in Joe. Now it's time to put that trust in Kamala. There were some inside Democratic leadership that had been pushing Biden to drop out of the race, despite his yeah. belief that his record and his skills meant he was the man to take on Donald Trump as the only nationally elected politician to beat Trump. Um, remind us how we got to what was a very difficult decision for the president, how we got here. Well, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think a lot of us will pay attention to that Atlanta debate on June 27th, where Biden uh, went up against the former president and seemed to stumble and almost appeared confused at times, something that he himself admits was a bad performance. That sort of sounded the alarms, if you will, among Democrats, both publicly and privately. Um, and then really in the weeks following that, um, certain polling as it relates to where the uh, horse race stood between Biden and Trump in certain battleground and swing states, certainly important uh, for whichever of these uh, nominees were to secure the win and, and then obviously get back into the White House. And to, once he started to see those numbers start to dip, I think that is really what turned the tide, if you will, in terms of the president reconsidering uh, his, his bid for the White House. But it's not just in those swing states. Uh, the president was losing momentum in normally blue states as well, New Mexico, New Jersey. Uh, states that otherwise would have 
you know, been easily uh, secured by presidents or a Democrat. Uh, and I, I think because of uh, that weakening number in terms of the polls, that's when those closest to the president really had to really gather up and, and decide how they wanted to move forward. Notable that the president did decide to endorse his vice president, Kamala Harris. We've talked about the enthusiasm surrounding her campaign just in the first few days uh, of that campaign announcement. They've raised more than $100 million in terms of grassroots donations. Obviously, we're seeing many of the Democratic subgroups, if you will, under that huge tent, new Democrats, moderate Democrats, progressive Democrats, young Democrats, uh, all saying that they are behind the vice president. And she's been out on the campaign trail looking to earn that support as well, making phone calls every single day to try to ensure that those who may be skeptical or may be concerned about this process, if you will, are standing behind her. Obviously, the big names are by her as well. Speaker Emerita, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, uh, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, just to name a few. And we've seen really Democrats on the federal and state level all come out to say that they are standing behind the vice president. Now uh, we'll see exactly what that path looks like for her to secure the nomination officially. And then the other big question, Errol, is who she decides to run with. That's right. And with the election now just 100 plus days away, Skyla Henry, thank you very much. You bet. President Biden's decision to leave the race now puts him on a small list of other U.S. presidents who've done the same. For example, the last time this happened was back in 1968 when Lyndon B. Johnson announced he would not seek a second term. Before that, Harry Truman withdrew from his race in 1952. Five other presidents also did the same in the mid to late 1800s. Lindsay Shavinsky joins us now. She's the executive director of the George Washington Presidential Library and the author of Making the Presidency, John Adams and the Precedents that Forged the Republic. It's great to have you with us on such a, a big night. So, so let's talk about the precedents of presidents doing this type of thing. How big of a decision was this for President Biden to not run again despite showing nothing but passion in the months leading up to this? Well, it was absolutely historic. As you could see in the speech tonight, Biden really loves this office. He loves everything that it represents and the history behind it. And I think that's because it takes a certain personality type. It takes a certain ego. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but a certain ego to believe that you are up to the challenges of the office, that you are the person that should be making those nearly impossible decisions that are going to cross the resolute desk. And so for a person like that to get to that place, especially after five decades of public service, and then to walk away is a very rare thing in American history, and I would say in human history much more broadly. And so considering how rare it is, I wonder how this moment compares to other presidents who've done similar things, because what he said in his speech tonight um, included comments like, quote, nothing can get in the way of democracy, even personal ambition. It's time for a new, fresh voice, and yes, even younger voices. I mean, specifically removing himself, he says, for the sake of the country and the party. How does that compare to, to presidents who've done similar things? So I think it separates him a little bit because when Harry S. Truman stepped down, he did so in recognition, of course, that he himself was quite unpopular, but also in recognition that the Republican candidate was going to be Dwight D. Eisenhower, who mm. was in some ways very similar in terms of foreign policy. He was going to reject the more isolationist strain represented by Robert Taft on the extreme wing of the Republican Party. And so I think Truman felt safe that the outcome would not destroy the United States. And for Lyndon Johnson, the w Vietnam War was so unpopular that it really kind of destroyed the entire Democratic Party. And while, again, he disagreed with Nixon on a lot of things, the Nixon of Watergate years was still in the future, and he was not seen as this dangerous menace. Whereas I think Biden and most of the Democrats view Trump as a threat to the republic, a mortal threat to the nation that has to be defeated at all costs. And so considering all of that, how does this decision impact the, the 51st year of, of Biden's public service and legacy? How does this button um, kind, of, kind of complete the overall picture? 
Well, the tricky thing about presidential legacies is it often depends on what happens next. Mm. That's how we actually view them. So who follows them changes our ideas about their time in office. You know, a great example of this is George W. Bush's popularity ratings just skyrocketed during Trump's time in office. And so I think it does depend a great deal on what happens in November. If Harris wins, I think that this will be kind of the crowning achievement in Biden's public service. He will be seen as a champion for democracy. If she loses, I still think this moment is a historic one and it's extraordinary, but there might be questions about should he have stepped aside sooner or should he have done something different to try and defeat Trump? Such an important detail to acknowledge that it depends what happens next with what this means in the larger picture. I'm, I'm curious what stood out to you from the president's speech. He often refers to his family. He often has a very folksy um, texture to how he um, speaks to the public. And he ended by saying, wow, you know, so remarkable that a kid, you know, from, from Scranton, Pennsylvania, with a stutter made it to the resolute desk. I thought that was such a powerful phrase. What stood out to you from what the president said from the Oval Office tonight? Well, I love that part, too, because to me, what comes through in this speech is Biden's belief in the United States in its capacity and its potential and its promise, even if we have been imperfect in executing that promise, which he did acknowledge. I thought the speech was really interesting in that it was bookended by principles. It started with history and it ended by this call to the better angels or the spirit of America, things that we can try and aspire to. And then in the middle, of course, he did have the politics. He had the things that he hoped he was remembered for, and he had the things that he hoped would help Harris. But I liked that that was not the beginning or the end. And instead, he did put it in the larger context. And although we couldn't see the portraits that he was referencing, there have been pictures of his Oval Office. And I think it does help remind him of the stakes of the moment when he's seen all of those famous faces in front of him. And moving forward and, and, and considering now the historic nature of Vice President Kamala Harris, you know, poised to win the Democratic nomination for the presidency, she would be um, the first woman of color as a major party nominee. There's this swell of support and enthusiasm all of a sudden for Democrats because of that. But if we think back to the 2016 election, Senator Clinton, or I should say Secretary Clinton, lost despite the historical nature of that race against Donald Trump. What is the significance of a potential Harris presidency and how might that help or hurt her chances? The United States is the only democratic society in the world that has not had a female head of state. And so I think that moment, whenever it comes, whether it's this year or in the future, will be a really important one because we as humans are actually not that imaginative and our brains have trouble envisioning things that we haven't seen before. And so until we actually see a woman in that position of power, it will be hard for little girls around the world to think that they too can do that, to see the presidency as a type of leadership that women can embody as well. I think it will be interesting to see over the next couple of months how this campaign maybe differs from 2016. Did Hillary Clinton start to sort of soften the ground to make people more comfortable with the concept of a female president, even if she didn't win? And so will it be just a touch easier for Harris to try and get to that higher office? So interesting. Lindsay Shavinsky, uh, great to have you with us on such an important night. I appreciate you speaking with us. Thank you for having me. And we want to bring you uh, this note from a Trump campaign official confirming that former President Trump did in fact watch President Biden's Oval Office address aboard his plane shortly after he concluded his rally in Charlotte tonight. And so certainly we expect the former president to speak more about that in the days and weeks ahead.